This is an interesting clock in the collection. It's made by Joseph Nibb in about 1675. And what makes it interesting is that it came from the Weatherfield collection. And David Arthur Weatherfield built up this collection in the 1920s. And at the time, it was the greatest collection of English clocks which had ever been collected together. And after he died, it was all set that these were going to be auctioned off in London as single lots. But in fact, they were sold uh, en masse to uh, Vernet in America. And he took half of the clocks and only half of them then went to, were kept in, in London. So this actually went to America and uh, returned uh, 70 or so years later. Here's the label from the Weatherfield collection of clocks. And up the top it says, uh, this clock was shown in Szczynski's English furniture book. So again, he's written in who it was purchased by, H. Pendleton Rogers in 1928. And that fits in with his signature at the bottom. And these are the books that it appears in, is Britain's Old Clocks and Watches, fifth edition. And it's illustrated in the Weatherfield catalogue, the original one, uh, 3131. And the, this skeletonized chaptering here is quite narrow in comparison with the width of the uh, dial plate itself. Most chapter rings come right out to the edge of the dial plate, whereas you can see this one is well in from the side. This makes the corners larger, and you've got these beautiful, complicated, rare uh, spandrels um, in each of the corners. So here we've got these wonderful complicated spandrels with flowers outside the little cherub's head here and really complicated wings disappearing all the way down. Um, beautiful. You can see the wonderful three-dimensional curving shape of the aperture for the calendar. It's not just a hole so you can see through it, but it's a design in its own right. This is typical of Nib that everything that is done is done to the highest possible quality. And that personifies to me the care and attention he put to the detail of his clocks. There's something about nib hands which make them recognizable from across a room. They're not just cut with a piercing saw. They've been beautifully scalloped. Each one of these swirls is a three-dimensional piece. Every minute is numbered on this clock. Uh, very expensive to do, and yet looks a beautiful dial, doesn't it? Beautiful chapter ring. And here you see the polished end of the winding squares. No maintaining power, no shutters, um, but you can see the dick of the pendulum again, moving backwards and forwards relentlessly going forward, but every now and every tick, it goes a little bit backwards. And so we have the lovely plain signature here now that uh, all Joseph Nibb's very early clocks had doggerel Latin with Londini um, on them to show it was um, of London or when he was in Oxford, it either had in Oxford or in Oxen or of Oxen. And the doggerel Latin has disappeared now and we've just got the plain London. And here you can see the exquisite detail in the hour hand and then the very simple half hour marker on the chapter ring does its job and yet it doesn't make a great grand statement of half hour. And here you can see these lovely little lozenge shaped uh, half hour markers, um, not making a great statement, 
but just serving the purpose, showing where the half hour is. And I always like to think that Nib was a very, very careful clockmaker, and he had a list of optional extras, and he didn't give anything away that the customer hadn't paid for. So if he paid extra for the skeletonized chapter ring, and he paid extra for the calendar, he didn't ask for maintaining power. That was just a bit too much for him, so it was left off. The case itself has interesting features in that all long cases originally were black ebony miniature buildings. And then they went to exotic woods, similar in shape, but uh, they were still miniature buildings. And the exotic woods then started to change and they introduced this parquetry, which gives three-dimensional looking patterns and then later on, they introduced marquetry as well. So this is, shows the progression from the plain case to the parquetry case to the marquetry case. So you can see the parquetry in the corners. That it looks three-dimensional here, like a fan. And that's the objective of parquetry is to make it these interesting shapes which your eye and brain turn round into being three dimensions. And not quite so much three dimensional in the, uh, the cartwheel here. And of course the actual marquetry um, is a picture. It makes no pretense of being in three dimensions. But I love these parquetry um, designs reminds me of uh, Isha and all his funny designs which you can see in different ways as you look at it. And here's the marquetry picture, this lovely vase of flowers. The leaves are in copper sulphate so that they have survived um, in the beautiful spring colour whereas all the other flowers which would have been bright yellows and pinks and reds and blues. Um, they were in vegetable dyes, so unfortunately, they've, over the years, they've faded away, just leaving the wood behind. So we've got the pendulum swinging here behind the lenticle, and this lovely piece of parquetry, again, goes into three dimensions, has a three-dimensional star, and the lovely little corner pieces, again, looking like a fan in three dimensions. And then in between, all the way around, you've got these wonderful oysters of olive wood cut across a branch to give the rings and the lovely shape. So that the panel has the walnut surrounds and it all cut cross grain um, here and here. And then the full panel has then been veneered with the wonderful oysters and the parquetry and marquetry designs. And right at the bottom here we've got another parquetry panel in the middle of the oysters of the olive wood and then a skirting has been put on round the bottom. Um, I doubt if that was original but um, that was probably added later. It's an interesting clock um, for more than one reason. First of all, the movement is a month-going movement. And although month-going clocks in themselves are not particularly rare, I would say that they formed less than 10% of Joseph Nibb's production. So they were obviously much harder to make and thus more expensive, and therefore there are less of them. In month-going clocks, it's normally the strike train, which is the difficult one to do, uh, because it's got to do 4,992 hour blows um, if it's going to work for 32 days, giving you a, one extra day before you have to wind the clock before it stops. So it's just coming up to four o'clock. It's warned. The, you saw the 
fly just move as the locking piece came and now it's going to come up to the hour and drop and there we go one two three four so with the count wheel system you have to first of all release the count wheel and it does this by putting in the second lock system which is going to happen about now there it goes and now it's waiting for the count wheel to take over and as soon as it drops and starts then it will strike six and then you'll see the uh, the locking lever drop into the six count on the count wheel and it'll stop the clock again so it's just coming up there we go one two, three, watch it drop and it locks into the count wheel. A lovely quiet tick and you can actually see the recoil in the escapement for each tick that's going ahead and back and each one, each tick then goes back very slightly in the recoil. not called a recoil escapement for nothing. <laughs> it actually drives the clock backwards all the way and every tick lifts the weight and then it goes down again for the next tick and then up a tiny bit and then down again. 